Well, hello and welcome to another episode of Help Me Believe, the show about Christian apologetics and theology. My name is Hayden Clark, your host, and I am excited to introduce my special guest to you. Her name is Laura Roberts. La- uh, excuse me, Laura Robinson. <laughs> Laura, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks uh, so much for agreeing to do this. Uh, like I was telling you beforehand, I am a, a listener of the NT uh, Review podcast, and so I'm very excited to have you on. I really love the podcast. I don't want to give too much away about the podcast. I'll let you talk about the podcast here in a minute uh, for the audience. But uh, for the audience members who may not be familiar uh, with who you are and what you do, uh, I thought it might be helpful if you give us a brief introduction. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, My name is Laura Robinson. I am a PhD candidate at Duke University. I am um, hopefully moving quickly towards the end of my dissertation. Uh, The the end is in sight. Uh, I specialize in New Testament studies at Duke. I teach New Testament studies. Um, I jog back and forth between teaching the undergraduates at uh, at Duke University and also some of the seminary graduates, uh, the the seminary graduate students at Duke Divinity School. And uh, I my my public facing identity is that I am the co-host of the New Testament Review, uh, a podcast that I co-host with Ian Mills, who is also a PhD candidate at Duke. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, so much for introducing yourself. Uh, I want to get to the the podcast because I really like it. But first, uh, how did you uh, you are a Christian? How did you become a Christian? And uh, then, kind of, how did you get so interested in New Testament interested in New Testament studies at all? But so interested that you are pursuing a PhD. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was I was born into a Christian family. I was raised Quaker, actually, uh, raised in a a rural Quaker church in Indiana. And when I was about 11 or 12, uh, my parents had born again experiences. And uh, we moved to a larger evangelical church. It was sort of a, you know, your classic large white Midwestern American evangelical church, a lot of college degrees, a lot of money, a lot of education. And um, this was the first place I'd really seen uh, biblical scholarship happen. You know, we'll we'll talk about the distinctions there. Sure. But um, my first foray into New Testament studies was there uh, through the lens of apologetics. There were a lot of most of the pastoral staff and a lot of the leaders in this church were very interested in apologetics, um, and I wanted to do that when I started to see that in action. Um, I. I went to Indiana University. I went there to study creative writing, and I picked up a double major in religious studies. Uh, and while I was there, I, um, I, uh, I, I, I first started to see like the historical critical method in action, the historical critical scholarship of the New Testament. Uh, and I, I think I got really good at kind of um, parroting the answers back to them that I thought I wanted my professors wanted to hear, you know, about some of these more sure. historical critical approaches. Uh, and I thought that when I got out of there, I would go to a Christian college and then I learned how to do real historical scholarship. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. you know, the, the way Christians do it. And, uh, and then I got to Wheaton college in Illinois and it turns out that the Bible classes were a lot like what we were doing at IU. And, uh, there's no, there's no route around, uh, around doing historical scholarship. So, um, I mean, it was a very safe place for a, uh, a 22 year old Christian to learn how to do those things because sure. we could talk about the way it was affecting our faith. But, um, and after that, never really looked back, uh, got into Duke in 2015. Um, so excited to be here. Absolutely love it. We just have the best faculty in the world. That's so. awesome. And, and it's yeah. really interesting that you mentioned that, uh, New Testament studies, uh, you were first introduced to it through pastors who were interested in apologetics because yeah. uh, just from my vantage point, and maybe things are changing, uh, hopefully that's for the better, but maybe things are changing where pastors are actually interested in apologetics and New Testament studies and things like that, uh, just because I haven't had uh, a similar experience. Um, but that's just kind of something I always lamented. So that's kind of cool that that's how it came about for you. Um, tell us about the uh, NT Review uh, podcast, how it got started, kind of what's the... Uh, the idea behind it, the philosophy behind it, and just kind of how it got started. Yeah, so uh, your third year of your doctorate, you take these things called comprehensive exams. And your comprehensive exams are just an extended series of essay questions you do on, um, that, that, that's just testing your, your whether or not you have a driver's license to write your dissertation, right? Do you have enough familiarity with uh, the basic scholarship of New Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible, Jewish studies was one of my minors. Um, there's a range of things you can read on. Um, but I 
went through this process with my one colleague at Duke. There are two New Testament students in my year, me and Ian. And we just started studying together and started reading these classic New Testament scholars. And we just really enjoyed uh, sitting down and talking to them and uh, talking about them and talking about their strengths and weaknesses. And the show really grew out from there. Um, we were honestly just having such a good time doing it and, and studying it uh, together. And we thought that at the very least, the work that we did together is uh, to, to learn this material could be useful to the students who would come after us at Duke, that we could uh, save our notes and save what we've been working on. Uh, but then it turned out that lots of people hated yeah. it. So, yeah, people like me out here in the in the wide world yeah. at, down here in North Texas listening to the yeah. podcast. Yeah. yeah. So we actually have quite a little audience now, which is a lot of fun. Yeah, so. it is pretty cool to see that happen. I've experienced it a little bit with this podcast. Uh, probably not to the extent that you guys have. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's interesting how you, you think maybe the, uh, people who are going to pursue uh, terminal degrees <laughs> in this field will use yeah. the material and then us out here are like no we we want this give us more yeah uh yeah. And, and it really is interesting i think and i think just something about technology maybe i haven't thought this all the way through but podcasting and and youtubing and stuff like that uh you can tell i'm i'm not very cool i don't know what the proper terms for those phrases are but uh just these different mediums have really exposed um the lay audience to more yeah. scholarship which i think is awesome it's fantastic I do too. Absolutely. um and and i think what scholars are starting to learn i'm not a scholar so like but i hear their feedback i think they're starting to learn you know what these lay people they can they can handle this information we can actually you know um if we can get the information to them outside of uh, uh, uh peer-reviewed journals and stuff like that they they can actually digest this material and understand it just fine which isn't really that much of a surprise to me but <laughs> i think uh, some scholars are starting to find that out um so I am a listener of, of the podcast. I really enjoy it. Um, and, and again, to the audience, I'll have a link in the description below to the podcast so that you can go and subscribe to that and leave a review for them to help them out. And you. Uh, you should definitely subscribe and leave a review. It is a fantastic podcast. Um, so this, what is today? Today's the 7th, so April 1st. You had an April Fool's Day podcast. I wasn't in on the joke because I wasn't around uh, last year for this for the podcast. I'm a somewhat new listener uh, so I haven't been around for a full year yet. So apparently last year, you guys. Uh, so for the audience, what they, what um, what Laura and Ian do is they find a, a work of scholarship um, and they review it and kind of talk about the strengths and weaknesses and things and the effect that it's had on the larger audience and things like that. And um, but it's always New Testament scholarship, like written at the scholarly level. Um, so apparently last year for April Fools, you guys came out and pretended that you were going to do the it was a 10 second show. It was a 10 second show. We did our intro. We said that today's text is case for Christ by Lee Strobel. Uh, and then we burst out laughing and told the audience we played a trick on that with the, the, this episode was streaming for 24 hours. We took it down <laughs> almost immediately. It was just for fun for our listeners. Uh, and then people started writing to us, asking us to actually review it. See, that's what I was going to say is <laughs> yeah. since, since your podcast, has garnered such a, a, a much larger audience than just yeah. you know future or current scholars in the field of people like me who are listening really enjoying things and then you come out and do the case for christ which is a popular level book uh, yeah. in our in our minds it's kind of like oh that would be really cool if they started doing popular level books too of course we're here for the scholarship but like i gotta say whenever i listen to the critique of the case for christ i thought it was really good like i thought oh this is good to know i would love to hear scholars opinions of popular level books uh, of course sure. that, of course that's not i understand there's nothing worse than hearing from one of your fans or somebody saying you guys should do this you guys should do that yeah, no, uh, no, no, no. because but we, but we like it it's nice to know what people are interested in what and that's kind of what you know i i don't think there's any chance that we'll take this show to be something you know what, what it is seems to be working really well but it was really fun to just make this big exception uh, and do something that people have been bugging us about for a long time. And, uh, you know, it, it bugging, I, I, I say that very affectionately. Right, yeah. Uh, but it was really fun to get to, to do it for real. Um, I, so many people have said it's their favorite episode of the show, <laughs> which just wounds me so deeply. Right, I was going to say that must, that's got, that's got to be a wound. It's like, wow, we poured our hearts and souls into all this 
really complex material and then we go do this one which is uh you know for you guys like a a, a slow pitch and and, yeah. pe and people are saying it's their favorite that's funny but yeah. but anyway so this this year uh in 2020 um they they actually do review the case for christ and so you think they're going to come out and do the same thing they did last year on april fools but Lo and, there's like a little pause there where you think it's going to happen again. But lo and behold, they do actually review The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And um, I found it very interesting because, I, I mean, I wouldn't call myself an apologist. I never have people have uh, referred to me as that. But uh, I definitely am interested in uh, philosophy and New Testament studies, which I think the two combined pretty much just equals apologetics. That's like what it is, to, in my opinion. But uh, so I am interested in apologetics, I suppose. And um, so seeing a, a, a work by a popular uh, level Christian apologist reviewed by some New Testament scholars was very uh, interesting to me and I found it all very insightful uh, I really did and I didn't take it as um, uh, mean-spirited or anything like that I'm sure you've probably gotten some comments like that or I don't know but I just whenever I was uh, it's, it's boys, you know? yeah yeah whenever I was listening I was like some people are gonna take this the wrong way but I did take it I, I suppose the right way and, and very much enjoyed it uh, but tell us um, what your thoughts were about the case for Christ. Of course, I'm not asking you to repeat everything that you you're like. I just did an episode on that. You can go listen. Um, <laughs> but uh, tell tell us uh, briefly what your thoughts on the book were. And um, you know, it seemed like to me in the episode that there were uh, two different categories of criticism. Uh, there was one about um, the testimonial part of it, and and I'd like for you to talk about that because I was like, I've never read the book, and I thought, wow, that sucks okay. if that if that's true. Um, and then there was the, the actual material itself, but, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the biography, I'll, I'll get through that fairly quickly because you can, we, we did some of this stuff on the, on, the, on, on our show. And if you want to get into depth there, that's, that's available. Um, the, I think the way the book is often discussed is in terms of Lee Strobel's own conversion story, right? Um, that he himself uh, was a skeptic. His wife became a Christian, and uh, and then he went and investigated the evidence for Christianity himself, and was so compelled by the evidence that he had to go and become a Christian himself. Um, when you look at the book, it's clear that whatever the investigation was that Strobel actually went through, and he nods this in this direction towards the very very end of the book, uh, but in the rest. Of the the rest of the book, I would say, leans very much the other way. Um, whatever is whatever the content of the actual book is, so most of the book is just interviews with um, mo with, with the Christian apologists. Um, whatever those interviews are, cannot have been the actual uh, investigative process by which Strobel himself became a Christian. Uh, I don't know what that process was for him, but it's not what's in this book. Um, it happened too late in life. This book came out in 1998, and uh, he became a Christian in 1981, he says in the intro. Um, most of the scholars he interviews were not active in the late 70s or early 80s. Uh, and... It, that in itself wouldn't be so bad, I don't think, that, you know, this is maybe not the actual process he went through, but it's something a lot like it. Um, except for the fact that he repeatedly presents himself as the skeptic that has to be won over in this book. And that's just not true. Uh, at the time that he wrote the book, he'd been a pastor for 10 years. He was not a skeptic. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you get these chapters of, you know, he goes in to sit down across from Cla Craig Blomberg, and he just, you know, he, he's a... Uh, He's just not buying this, and he's so incredulous. It's like, well, this is Cole clearly quite put on, right? You actually do buy this a lot. And that's a... I, yeah, I, I found that whole thing distasteful. Um, but also the thing I was least... The, the thing that, as a historian, I'm the least interested in, except that, you know, your, your historical tools come out every time you're reading a narrative and you want to check for plausibility. Um... But the bigger issue I had with this book, um, and we reviewed very little of it for this show. We really just tried to stick with stuff that was within the purview of, uh, of a New Testament scholar. Uh, so the so Bl Blomberg's interview and Bruce Metzger's interview. Mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted to stick with talking about that. And I think a lot of the evidence that's, in, that's thrown out in those chapters – um, is either just straight up incorrect. There's a number of mistakes. Uh, it is marshaled to answer questions that that scholarship wasn't really meant to answer, so it's misapplied, uh, or it's kind of wrong by degrees. You know, so it's not it's not completely wrong, but it's definitely a bit inaccurate. 
it. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you want to hear specific examples for all of that, um, pull up the show, but that was, that, that was the way I generally approached it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, if you do want to, uh, and you're, and you're going to, because I'm, I'm telling you audience, you got to go subscribe, uh, to the NT review podcast. Um, and you'll find, uh, one of their, uh, latest episodes, at least, uh, I don't know if it's the latest one or not, but, uh, you could, yeah, you, well, I'll do an Easter show coming up soon. Yeah, so you can, you can see, uh, in more detail what, uh, Laura was just summarizing here. Um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of disheartening to me. I've never read the book. Of course, I've obviously yeah. heard of Lee Strobel as someone interested in Christian apologetics. Um, so it was definitely disheartening. Uh, it doesn't really bother me that someone gets their facts wrong. Um, there's so much information out there. One person can't possibly read everything and know all the counterfactuals to their argument. Of course, if you're going to undergo an investigation like that, you would think that you would, uh, at least to a large degree. But uh, that doesn't really bother me. It was the biographical stuff that I was just like, man, that sucks. Of course, I haven't read the book, um, but if he does pre present himself that way in the book, that would stink. Um, but but anyway, uh, one gets the impression uh, in listening to the episode between you and Ian um, that you or, or possibly Ian or both feel that there's a pervasive problem uh, that Lee is exemplifying in his book, um, it, that there's a per pervasive problem like that in apologetics in general uh, as far as the misuse or misapplication of scholarship. And so I guess my question is, do you actually feel that way? And uh, what sort of mistakes do you see apologists making? Yeah. Um, so part of the tough thing when you're talking about a book that's based on interviews is it's it's hard to always know who's who the mistakes belong to. Right. Uh, you know, or the, the mistakes in the inter or the, the interviewee who uh, is he or she misrepresenting or misunderstanding or uh, uh, some of the stuff, or is it getting lost in translation? You know, because Lee Strobel's not a New Testament scholar. I don't expect him to know all the minor points. I think there's two things here. I think the first layer of problems is the way that history is applied to the apologetic project. Uh, and I think that history tends to be done... Um, badly when it's being put towards an end that I don't think history is for. So when we're talking about the ancient world, you know, we're talking about 2000 year old history. We're talking about an era where we have, um, a minimal, a minimal textual record of what happened, a minimal archeological record of what happened. We obviously have no, uh, witnesses who can tell us about things. We, we really are, um, we're we're really flying blind when we try to reconstruct ancient history, right? So a lot of ancient history is really ambiguous, and a lot of stuff we're never going to be able to know for sure with more with more than sixty percent accuracy. Um, and for apologetics, you know, if this is going to be the reason why you uh, dedicate your life to Christianity or why you're going to believe in God. 60% uh, is usually not good enough, right? Uh, and I think what apologetics tends to make people want to do is find things with, is, is to say that you can prove things with 90% certainty or 100% certainty. And that's just not how anything in the ancient world works, right? Uh, so even when we're talking about something as fundamental as who wrote the Gospel of Mark, you know, we're talking about one textual, one, one author who gave us the history of Mark, uh, who is wrong about other things, who is the basis from which all other ancient voices get the idea that Mark was the interpreter of Peter, uh, and which seems to have a lot of counter evidence in Mark's own text itself. You know, we're, we're talking about something that, you know, a, a lot of apologists would really like to, us to say that, you know, okay, Papias lived 30 years after lived 30, 40 years after uh, Jesus did. He would have known better than anyone else who wrote Mark. Um, he had these eyewitnesses. He knew the second generation of the apostles. If he said it, that settles it. And history just doesn't work like that. You just can't take the one guy... You, you just can't take the one guy as gospel truth. Um, but in... I, I would never want to say that Papias' witness is not relevant information or we shouldn't take it seriously or that there's no value to it. Um, but it's one piece of data among others, right? And we have to weigh the mistakes that we know Papias did make. And we have to weigh the uh, the way that other, other ancient voices were using him and the way that that's considered. Uh, and when we, when we take that when we take that out and we work out from there, uh, we're not looking at 90% certainty anymore. We're looking at 
40% certainty, you're 30%. And, uh, and I think that's what historians need to, um, historians can be honest about that, that we just can't prove so much of this stuff. Um, but a lot of times apologetics just has too much writing on it to be that honest about how unclear history really can be. So that's the first set of problems, I would say that, you know, I think uh, uh, apologetics forces us to look for certainties when we can actually really only find probabilities and even possibilities. Yeah. Um, and the second thing I would say about that is I worry a lot about in light of that, in light of the fact that so much of biblical history cannot be reconstructed with any like real high degree of certainty, I worry about this as a basis for faith. Mm -hmm. Because then what happens is once you start knocking down those certainties, people's faith goes with it. And I think that you're, the object of your faith when you're a Christian isn't historical scholarship. It's not these ways of knowing that have been tried and tested in universities and are interfallible and are constantly being revised and constantly being re-explored. The object of a Christian's faith has to be the revelation of Jesus Christ in the person, uh, the revelation of, of God in the person of Jesus Christ, resurrected and present and available in the lives of Christians right now. That revelation is directly accessible to us. We don't have to look at ancient history to go dig this up or, you know, try to find evidence that Jesus is alive. For the same reasons, I don't have to find evidence that I, I don't have to go look at birth records to find out evidence that my husband's alive. I can talk to him and interact with him. And Jesus <laughs> is the same way, right? So I, I think that um, I worry that historical apologetics treats Jesus like he's a lot deader than he really is, yeah. uh, because we don't need to go look at ancient history for access to Jesus. We can he, he's alive. We can we can access him right now. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Laura's bringing the heat. Okay. That's a long, that's a, that was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was a very good answer. Actually, I, I very much appreciate it. Uh, so it seems like um, you, you feel that apologetics can sometimes, or perhaps most of the time, or whatever, uh, pretend that they have certainty when, when really it's something like 30 or 40%. Um, and then, of course, um, that, that you don't want to make that the basis of Christian faith. And I think those are two very reasonable objections. Uh, I think that's probably true. Um, I'm sure I've, I've done some of that as well. And, um, but, but I do, um, you know, the more I study and the more I read into these things and just start, you know, reading and studying just in and of its own right with no end necessarily in mind, which I think is, which might be, correct me if I'm wrong, if it's probably one of the major critiques is if you already have this goal in mind, of course you're going to, uh, um, you know, study this material and, and find a, the apologetic value in it. Yeah. But, um, in, in it, but it, I mean, it may be the case that you study it in and of its own right and you say, wow, um, it may be, Maybe uh, some more insight from from you here would be interesting. Um, but you know, what if you really are just an objective reader and you're just interested in history for the sake of history, and you're reading Papias and the New Testament uh, literature and things like that, and you say, "Wow, there really is actually, you know, uh, perhaps um, there's more credibility to what the New Testament records than I thought, or there's, you know, maybe there's actually something here to to at least to the extent of, you know." Maybe Christianity isn't so stupid or something like that. Not I have 100% certainty, but hey, maybe this isn't all nonsense after all. Yeah. So um, what I would say is that as a you, – you're never going to be a truly objective reader of history, right? right? No one expects that of you. It's not possible. Everyone has to come from some perspective. And also nobody, nobody reads about the New Testament because they don't care, right? You yeah. know, everybody – Nobody would spend 10, year, 10 years studying this for no job security and making peanuts uh, if they didn't care about the New Testament, right? I mean, everyone gets into this field because they care, and most of them get into it because they care because they're Christians. Um, people's faith can change a lot during the course of historical study, but it's, in my experience, most people still have it when they're done. Um, and if I had to give a... a Laura's reason why, uh, I would say that the central historical claims about Christianity, and I'm going to, I'm going to bracket out the supernatural ones sure. here, right? Because how you deal with things like miracles or the, you know, that that's a whole other historiography conversation, but the historical facts of Christianity that I think are really central to Christianity. So like the life and death of Jesus, um, his, uh, the basic tenor of his teaching, the foundation of the church. I think all of this is as knowable as anything else in ancient history is, right? So it's not 
it's it's not where a lot of people want it to be. It's not 100% certainty, but it's also not trash, right? It's also yeah. not yeah. nothing. It's not less um it's not less knowable than other contemporary events that were happening at the time, you know, like the fall of Jerusalem uh, in, in AD 70. Um, but I, I think that that's where I would want to locate most of what Christians are doing. What, what most of what Christians can do with history is uh, they can put it in conversation with other ancient ancient historical scholarship. And I think that puts us right about um Right about where you really need to be, to be honest, uh, to know that the the central claims of Christianity are not significantly less reliable or less true or less verifiable than um, th- th- than what happens with other contemporary scholarship. And also, what I think is just tremendously valuable, probably way more than apologetics, is it just helps us to understand the world from which this stuff emerged, right? Because when we study Paul or Jesus with our modern American eyes, we're going to read him as an American, right? You know, I'm going to, I, I, without some sort of um, of intervening uh, lens or reading strategy, I'm going to put the fact that I'm a white middle-class American woman on these texts, and I'm going to read it with the presuppositions that such a person would have. But when I study ancient Judaism, or when I study the first century Levant, or when I study the Roman Empire, uh, that helps me to see these people if not as they really were you know which is we're never really going right. to get there perfectly but we're gonna uh we're gonna be able to contradict a lot of uh a lot of our own biases and i think that's very worthwhile too yeah so uh, do you think that apologetics per se uh and i'll just define that as answering the questions or objections of skeptics has its place in the church or should the entire endeavor kind of be abandoned I mean, apologetics is a huge category, right? Yeah. It's a 2,000 year old tradition in the Christian church. And, and also, it looks like a lot of things. Like Contra Kelsum by Origen, I think, is an apologetic text. Um, I think that anytime um, a, somebody answers a misunderstanding about Christianity or about Christian belief or practice, that's a kind of apologetic. So, a lot of uh, dogmatic theology can mm-hmm. have a very apologetic function um, if just keeping. Uh, so, sort of weeding the garden to make sure that falsehoods don't emerge in popular understanding of what Christianity is. I think all that stuff is great. I think that's all very worth doing. Um, I think when it gets to the practice of trying to prove the historical claims of Christianity with something other than the revelation that God himself has given us we get onto very icy territory because that's the point at which i think we start building faith out of something in in, uh and i mean faith in a in a fully relational sense here i don't just mean like intellectual ascent right Right. i mean uh you know a relationship with with god a relationship with jesus and a relationship with other christians everything that is accompanied that is encompassed in the idea of faith um i think once we start building uh building that experience on something other than revelation directly from god in our actual interaction with god then we get into really really dangerous territory because as soon as that goes and it can and it does it goes all the time you know i mean um historiography is not that old of a discipline and a lot of the uh the the epistemological assumptions we make as academics um, they are subject to revision and they're not, they're definitely not as old as the Bible. Uh, and I think once we start building our faith on those things, uh, then, then they can change the way historiography does, or they can change the way the Academy does. And that gets really dicey. Um, so I would, uh, yeah, I, I would, if anyone told me that they were doing some kind of apologetic project where they were trying to prove some sort of um foundational claim about uh, some foundational historical claim about christianity um beyond what i think is is necessary you know so on the list of things that i think are provable are you know the idea that jesus was a person that he lived in judea that he was jewish that he traveled around with disciples that he was lived in uh in jerusalem and was crucified you know that's all that's all 
that's all fine. We can get all, we can get there with the tools of history. When we get to things like, was he God? Or uh, did he have the relationship with God that Christians believe he did in the Trinity? Uh, was he the second person of the Trinity? Was he resurrected? Did the Holy Spirit come? When we get to those level of claims, I don't think that knowledge is something we can get with history. And I'm really glad we can't because I think that's knowledge we need to get directly from God in the revelatory process. Yeah, now that's a good answer. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, one thing that pops into mind is kind of a follow up question there. Yeah. Um, just because I do engage, um, or I've engaged on this podcast at least with uh, three or four atheists, and mm -hmm. um, I have uh, like my best, my literal best friend is an atheist. Like I, you know, I engage the skeptical mind, um, mm -hmm. and I can just so I sometimes hear the skeptical mind in my own mind. <laughs> like I know what they would say to this. Um, um, I have had a skeptical mind. You know? <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, well, we all do, right? I yeah. Know, yeah. Well, I, the, the best it's the best way to be but you know yeah exactly uh and yeah. so i can so it seems that okay on the one hand you have some apologists who might uh would say anchor the faith on um the historical reliability of the new testament and and or the resurrection or something like that i'm just being really quick here and uh it seems more like you're saying um we can get some stuff from that but what we really need to be anchored on is uh this uh, personal experience with god yeah. here in the present and, um, of course, you know, you can be skeptical about anything, but, um, mm -hmm. some people are going to say, yeah, well, you know, uh, Muslims or, um, you know, whoever, uh, they, they, they believe that they've had a, a personal experience with their God. Um, mm -hmm. so how is this becoming, um, in, in some kind of objective sense? And, and I've never talked to you about this before, so maybe it's not, um, how's this yeah. in some sort of, uh, objective sense? A, a ground for truth, a ground for knowing that yeah. Christianity is actually true. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, the 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 person that needs to be persuaded in the individual's encounter with God is not those guys out there, right? You know, so I think that's part of what I would say is, you know, if somebody came up to me and said, you know, I don't think that you know the resurrected Christ, I think. A very honest way to have to answer is, I don't care what you think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't for you, was it? And, uh, and I, I would hope that they had the same level kind of experience, or that in participation with in in a church community, that they would that they would have access to the same kind of thing. But I I think the short answer is that the the individual's interaction with God and the experience of God revealing God's self to us, um, it, it's not a, I don't want to say it's not an objective experience. Cause I think if I say objective, it makes it sound like I'm saying it's not real. And that's not what I mean at all. Uh -huh. Um, I, I mean that it's not, um, no, I mean, it can be subjective. I mean, I think it is. I've had this experience. It certainly is subjective. And maybe this is what you're going to say, but I wouldn't use it to convince a skeptic. Um, right. Because they're always going to be able to say, well, I've never felt that way. Of course, Which is yeah. like, well, duh. But if you did, you would know it was real. Right. And I would and I would also, I, you know, I would hope that they had that same level of experience. And, um, but, but I, yeah, I, I think what I would... The, the short answer is that I don't think anybody's relationship with Jesus is for anyone else's gotcha. uh, persuasion. I think it's just a, it, it's a thing that starts and ends in God and, uh, and God reveals himself to, uh, to, to be the, he, God has the freedom to choose where and how God does that. Yeah. So, yeah. So a big thing that you see with, Christian apologetics, specifically on the side of like historical apologetics, New Testament apologetics, is the question of the resurrection. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it kind of seems, uh, you know, you'll hear um, you'll hear uh, people say, you know, Paul himself said that if there was no resurrection, then, um, you know, our faith is in vain or things like that. And so it does seem to be the central claim of Christianity. And if mm -hmm. it can be supported from historical evidence, then that could be persuasive to a skeptic. And so, um, but, I, but I'm, I'm, I'm listening to you and noting the, the obvious fact that it was left out of the core facts that you think uh, can be shown uh, to be uh, historically reliable uh, from a doing the historical method. And so uh, maybe why is that? And then also, what would you then say to someone who said, um, yeah, I just don't believe that, you know, people can be resurrected? Yeah. Um, 
so I, I, the, the obvious answer to why I don't think it can be historically proven is that generally speaking, I think history works by analogy. Um, and we tend to, it, it, historians tend to assume that the way the world works now is the way it has always worked. So I would say that events that, the, the way that events cause and affect one another, the way that people interact now uh, is roughly analogous to the way it's been in history. This is a huge problem for the supernatural in history, right? Um, it doesn't mean that supernatural events never happened. It's just that if we don't say them about modern events, we probably shouldn't make special pleading to claim that we can prove them about ancient events, right? Um, like I said, not saying it didn't happen, right. saying we can't prove it. Um, but Way more importantly, I think, is how did Paul know Jesus was resurrected? Uh, he didn't. He, he, he didn't go interview Craig Blomberg, right? He uh, got knocked off his camel on his way to Damascus because it turned out Jesus was very much alive and had some very strong feelings about what Paul was doing. Uh, I don't know if it was a camel. I just I have camel in my head. But, uh, yeah. but he had a dramatic experience of Jesus where Jesus, who is alive and still does this, uh, made himself very clear to Paul, and it changed everything in his life, and everything that Paul did after that was built on that. Paul did not build his understanding on the fact that Jesus was resurrected on some data and information he had prior to that. The knowledge that Jesus was resurrected and the experience of knowing Jesus raised, that's the foundation. So that's where I would want to start. Um, is that the way we know that the resurrection happened is because, you know, it's a uh, what, what's the the hymn we sing at Easter? You know, you ask me how I you know he lives. He lives within my heart. It's a little saccharine, right? And it sounds a little bit, you know, like, well, I just have this. Um, it, 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 I, I don't mean, I think the way people can take that is, you know, like, well, I have just chosen to believe it independent of any evidence. No, it's a, it's a, relation, it's a relational kind of knowledge. It's a right. spiritual kind of knowledge. It doesn't have anything to do with, I, I don't think, with history. Um, I, I, I do think, you know, if, people listening to this show are finding that very unsatisfying. I think a lot of counter explanations for what might have happened are fairly easy to falsify. Uh, you know, I don't think you can prove Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Right. Um, I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a better and more likely version of the story. Uh, but I, I think that what we can reconstruct with history really ends at the cross. Um, and it, and, it, and it kind of does for Paul, too, doesn't it? Paul, uh, Paul gets to, he was buried, and then, uh, and, and then from there, it's all, it's all revelation. It's all who Jesus appeared to alive in the flesh, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, if, if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. Um, and I think the analogy you gave earlier, and, and, and I do want to say that apologies, I know a lot of apologists, who uh, leave room for this uh, personal experience and stuff in their apologetic. Uh, William Lane Craig would be uh, among one of the, definitely probably the most popular uh, Christian apologists in the world, uh, who I think has often said, though he does make the historical arguments for the resurrection, I do believe he's always left the qualifier in there that even if we didn't have this, I think there would still be uh, good reason to think that Christianity is true. And I think that's mostly based off uh, some of the stuff that you've been talking about, this personal uh, individual experience uh, with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so I do want to say that, you know, in case there are people out there freaking out that we're, we are daring to have this conversation. But uh, yeah, so I do think that apologists have left that in their uh, apologetic personal experience. But yeah. Uh, so I'm not a, a scholar, obviously. Uh, that shouldn't have been hard to figure out. But one thing that uh, I love about diving into a large body of literature is, uh, well, first of all, I, I want to turn to the audience real quick. If you want to get um, good, uh, if you want to get access to scholarly uh, articles, which can kind of be a pain in the butt if you're a lay person like me who goes looking for them and you're like, I don't have access to these. I need like an institution that will give me access to them. There is a company called Deep Dive. That's D-E-E-P-D-Y-V-E. -E -E. I think it's deepdive.com, um, where you can pay one subscription and they give you access to a bunch of journal articles. So whenever I go looking for um, uh, New Testament scholarship on any given subject, I start there uh, because I pay monthly to get that. Again, it does cost money, but I do this daily because I'm a freak like that, and, and and so I think it's well worth it. And that's one way that lay people like me can get access to good scholarship. Um, they have... There's four or five New Testament 
article uh, journals that you can get access to just through the um, uh, right. the, the Novum Testamentum, uh, yeah. the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. Um, the uh, there's there's more the Journal for the Study of the New Testament, uh, theological journals and things like that that touch on New Testament subjects. Um, but anyway, so just for the audience, I wanted you to know that actually there I I found the solution. I found one solution anyway. Uh, it took me a while to come across that little That's website, great. but no. you could go ahead. Jeez. Is another popular option. I think that one's a lot more expensive. I get it through my college, uh, but JSTOR is also very popular. Uh, mm -hmm. People want to read stuff. Um, and then a lot of, you know, Cambridge and Oxford online. Uh, those are all, that's where I start if I'm studying something. Mm -hmm. uh, just, I have to plug Cambridge resources because I have an article coming out with New Testament studies soon. So, uh, you know, that's just yeah. going to go for that one right there. Uh Oh, you didn't, you, sorry, you started to talk about scholarly. Oh, no, no, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I just wanted to hear what you had to say. Uh, so, but anyway, so back to it. That was just for the audience, a little, yeah. little thing. There's kind of an alternative way to get around having to subscribe to a number of different uh, journals in order to, uh, you end up spending a lot of money that way and you can get it all in one place. And that's how I do it. But anyway, just for the audience there. So, uh, but again, what was I saying? Yes, I'm not a scholar, right? Uh, but one thing I love about diving into the literature, scholar, scholarly literature, uh, is number one, I just learned so much, but, um, I, but, but you get to hear, uh, kind of a homogenous take on, on, on the, uh, subject and see listen to voices from all over the world. And it has the effect on me that, wow, so many different people agree on this. And they're all like PhDs in the in the area. Um, it's probably because there's, you know, they're making a very good argument here. And I've had to change my mind on a number on, on a number of things, not even just with New Testament studies, but also in the areas of uh, philosophy and and science and things like that. Um, and but I love that. I love ha having to change my mind. I love being met by such good evidence and such good truth that I have to check my own biases as the conservative evangelical and, uh, you know, change my view on things. So have you had similar experiences where you've um, maybe even in the uh, uh, just doing your your dissertation and, and doing your uh, Ph.D. studies there at Duke? Have you had to change your mind on some things? Kind of what was that like? Did it cause you any doubt? Um, and, um, and and if this if you have had this experience, what are some things that you've changed your mind on? Yeah, um, this is, uh, I mean, a big part of it is honestly just what I'm talking to you about right now. I think for a lot of my life, I would have thought that the alternative to uh, sort of a historical positivistic outlook towards Christianity, I would have thought the alternative was thoroughgoing agnosticism. Uh, and I don't think that's true anymore. I think there are lots of ways to know about um about God that weren't invented by professors, which is great news. Uh, I think I think that's outstanding news. Yeah. Um, I I you know I think that one thing that a lot of what happens I think when you start going down this historical route and studying uh, uh, studying ancient history a lot is a lot of times what happens is you don't you realize you didn't even know enough to be wrong before you got started. It's not really that you're wrong. It's that your entire paradigm keeps shifting every time you get access to this whole other area of scholarship. Um, I think the single biggest shifts in my scholarship that I've had over the last five, 10 years have all been related to uh, the New Testament's relationship with Judaism. Right. Uh, I, I, I think even just starting from the, you know, I think the first big shift I had when I was a master's student was understanding that the world of first century Judaism was so foundational to the perspective that any of these people were writing from and that they didn't have a, they, they didn't have a 21st century evangelical 20 year old woman's uh anxieties and concerns they had a first century jews understandings and concerns and that that was one of the big first shifts um and then from there the the thing that really started to become my preoccupation as i got to duke was the question of how judaism and christianity relate to each other now uh and, and especially how did they become different religions because it's not really intuitive that they are different religions right, right yeah. uh, jesus was himself jewish all of his original disciples were jewish paul was jewish uh, basically every significant uh first century christian you can name or first century uh participant in the jesus movement was jewish um and the fact that this became 
uh, a movement made up primarily of ethnic Gentiles that define itself not just in opposition to Judaism, but often in very hostile ways to Judaism. Um, I don't think it wasn't inevitable that that happened, and I became really fascinated with how that happened, how how that happened, and then what does that mean for Jews and Christians now? How do we how do we be good neighbors of Jews in light of the fact that for a really long time we we were not good neighbors, uh, and in fact read uh, read a very Jewish book in some really destructive ways. How, how do we how do we fix that? How do we turn that around? Um, so I think that's. Um, yeah, it's not that I realized I was wrong about something. It's that I realized I just wasn't even paying attention yeah. to this really important central thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I, I kind of needed someone to tell me it mattered. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. Um, yeah. And I think what you said about just, uh, I can't remember how you worded it, but you said, you know, it's it's not necessarily that you were wrong. It's that you just, you, you didn't even have a big enough paradigm to know uh, basically what my dad always said to me, you don't know what you don't know. It, right. th there's not knowing. And then there's not knowing what you don't even know right. exists out there. <laughs> it's right. kind of like, that's how we start when it comes to history. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I was saying, you know, in the, you know, people talk about the idea of like the Dunning Kruger effect that the, mm. the way you evaluate your own competency in a subject is the same knowledge that you have of the subject in the first place so it's very easy to start out in this field and think that you are uh that you're a little upstart in the world of historical studies and you are not <laughs> you yeah are yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's basically the the old saying of knowing just enough to you know get yourself in trouble or whatever knowing just sure. enough to sound stupid or something like that i don't know uh, i've definitely done that myself of course we yeah, we, we all have of course well first um, century students do it you yeah. know everybody thinks they found the mistranslation that changes the whole bible yeah you know? yeah of course yeah. Yeah. i think i i first not probably not first but a big uh, a big moment when i really experienced it was whenever i did a um i haven't finished it yet but i started a master's of arts in philosophy and i remember yeah. sitting in that first metaphysics class and i remember thinking what is metaphysics and <laughs> And listening to a definition of it, I was still like, I still don't know what you're even, you're speaking, yeah. you might as well be speaking French. I don't know what you're saying. And that was yeah. that whole, I don't, it's not that I don't know. It's that I don't even know what I don't know. I don't, I don't even, know. even know how to start getting yeah. the tools to start learning the subject. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so I think this creates in people, and this is why um, I said this recently, and I think it's very true, is that the, the smartest people I know, and a lot of people that I see, not all of them, but a lot of people that I see with terminal degrees, with PhDs in very specific fields. Um, in other words, the smartest people I know are the most humble and the least arrogant people that I know. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's, sure. it's usually the people who know a few facts, know just enough to get themselves in trouble like we we're just talking about, that are very arrogant whenever it comes to the claims that they make. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because I think uh, a lot of people don't realize, and of course, I'm not speaking from experience, how much literature, and you can speak from experience if you'd like, how much literature you actually have to engage with to write a dissertation or to get a PhD in, to, in, in a very specific field like that. And whenever you, uh, again, I'm not speaking from experience, but I know people like this. And whenever you um, do that, you realize, wow, there's just so much that I don't know. Or there's, yep. um, you know, or I can't make this claim that it that I know it with 100% certainty or something like that. Uh, but maybe you can speak to that yourself. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I, so much of scholarship is dependence on the work that other people have done, right? Even if it's showing you the mistakes you don't want to make yourself. Uh, so, so much of of scholarship is needing to, um, is needing to count how to what other people can tell you. Uh, and I think that's a really important intellectual virtue. Uh, it, it takes, um, it takes a tremendous amount of work to be, uh, to be an expert in even a very small area. And, uh, a, a big part of learning to be a good student, I think is learning to respect that. Um, even when you do disagree, right. Uh, I had a professor at, uh, at Indiana university, David Brackey. He's a, he's a, really big Gnostic scholar. Um, he's not at IU anymore. He's since moved on. But he used to say that um, smart people believe all kinds of things. And I never forgot that because I've thought about it ever since. Uh, I, I tend to be a 
bit of a, I, I don't know if I'd call myself a hothead, but I can definitely be very opinionated. I can definitely be very uh, hard headed. Uh, and I have to tell myself that one a lot that, uh, you know, nobody, almost nobody believes what they believe because they are delusional or because right. they're thinking or because or because I'm just so much smarter than they are. Right. Uh, you know, a lot of times there's there's a good reason for believing what they believe. And, and, uh, and I remember David Brackey would say this about um, he taught all the early Christianity classes when I was at IU and people would, uh, you, you know, when you're studying early Christianity, you can find a lot of really crazy beliefs that sound nothing like modern Christianity or a lot of crazy practices that sound nothing like modern Christianity, like being a, being a stylite, standing on a pole all day or uh, believing in uh, pre-existent uh, a- aeons that are the agents through which the world was created. You know, it just doesn't really sound like anything a lot of people believe today. But if you back up, there's almost always a comprehensible reason for it. Even if you don't, accept that logic yourself or if you don't accept the belief itself. So I I think those are just, um, and, and, you know, circling this back to the question of how can historians, um, avoid the mistakes that I think I see in, in Lee Strobel's book is just being aware of what you don't know and being aware that there's, if, um, that when, when you're working these things out, uh, if you don't have that level of expertise yourself and you don't have that level of training yourself, or if you're talking, if you're answering a, uh, a historical belief that to you just sounds completely crazy or completely stupid, there's probably someone out there who has more information on the subject than you do and go look it up, go find them. You know, there's lots of people who would love to help you. Yeah. Uh, you know, no, I think that's, that's great advice. I think, uh, there's, uh, I think there's a lot of fear involved in it. Um, you know, if I go read this book or if I go actually hear this person out as to why they believe what they believe, it might make too much sense to me, yeah. and then I'll have to change my mind, which is a paradigm shift, and yeah. uh, I might have to change my life as a as a, as a as a Jesus as a, has to be the foundation of your faith, or <laughs> otherwise you'll you could lose it, right? right? Yeah, it's, somebody... a, it's definitely a good critique. It's a good point. Um, yeah, I think that's why a lot of people are, are afraid to just even listen to people. And so yeah. that's where the arrogance and stuff comes in, um, just because they're afraid that they might have to change their mind about something. Maybe they were wrong, and ne- because if you change your mind, you might have to change your life, like I said. Uh, but, Laura, this has been so much fun. I really do yeah. appreciate you coming on. i got one uh, final question for you. Uh, but before mm-hmm. that, I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for, uh, for joining us today, and a special thanks to our Patreon supporters. Um, who get access to our bonus segment, which we are going to go into right after the interview. Uh, five more minutes with Laura Robinson right here at Help Me Believe. And if you want access to not only that bonus segment, but all of our bonus segments as well as uh, plenty of other exclusive uh, content, you can get it over at our Patreon website, uh, which is uh, – I'll leave a link in the description below to that, labeled Support Help Me Believe. And you can go there and, like I said, get access to not only um, the bonus segment with uh, Laura today, but all of our bonus segments and other content as well. So again, thank you to our patron supporters. Really appreciate it. Uh, Laura, one last question would be, what advice do you have to people who are interested in um, evangelizing uh, atheists, agnostics, people like that who come to the table with objections to Christianity, including historical objections and things like that? Uh, What advice would you give to someone like me? So what advice would you give me uh, as far as... uh, answering those objections and not committing the uh, mistakes that you see uh, apologists make with respect to uh, history? Um, I think the number one thing I would say is to be a very good listener uh, and not to assume you know somebody's story or you know somebody's narrative. Um, don't fit them onto the train tracks that, you know, will, that, that lead in your head to how somebody comes to believe those things. Uh, you know, I actually, I have to laugh. I've actually had students ask me in class cause they don't know I'm a Christian. Right. And they, uh, in, when I teach at Duke undergrad, uh, and a lot of times when they hear me talking as a historian, they think I must not be. So I've had students <laughs> ask you know, like what bad thing happened to me to make me not a Christian. And, you know, I have to, and, and, and they're being sweet, right? Oh, Christians, Christians asking you this? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, I see. You know, they're inner 20-year-olds. You know, they you know they don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And, 
but you know, but the thing is, is you know, I can hear you can hear so many things in there, right? One is that you don't always know what somebody believes until you really start talking to them, and in more than talking to them when you really start listening to them. Um, and you also don't know why they believe that. So be the kind of person who asks really good questions, uh, not with an agenda, not looking to bring them to where you want them to go, uh, but be a, be a good listener and, um, and, and let people tell you the, their own stories. That's what I would want to remind everybody. I think that's great advice and I really appreciate it, Laura. It's been uh, so much fun to have you on again. I, I really do love the podcast and everybody listening should go follow the link in the description below and go follow, um, share, and leave a review of the NT Review, New Testament Review podcast. And again, I'll leave a link in the description to that. Laura, so, uh, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day from writing your dissertation and all that to come uh, do the interview. Uh, I really appreciate it, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Have a good one.